<clears throat> well, hi, everybody. It's really nice to be here speaking with you tonight. And thank you to Elaine, as always, for organizing these talks. And as she mentioned, the title of my talk is Adult Alienated Children, A Deeper Understanding. And my purpose is to share with you what I've learned about adult children of parental alienation and to propose some ways to respond to that situation, which is obviously extremely painful. So there's not a lot that's humorous about parental alienation from the child's point of view and certainly not from the targeted parent's point of view, but I still wanna start with a cartoon. Um, it's from the New Yorker, it came out back in 2007. And in this picture, you can see that the guy in the dark suit is having a rough time. He's nursing a drink, he looks forlorn, he has bandages all over his face indicating he's been in some kind of a scuffle. And life has really taken a turn for the worse for this guy. And then here's the caption. Since we didn't have children, my ex turned the cats against me. And what I like about this cartoon is that it clearly shows how painful it is to have even your cats turned against you. I think it also implies that there are some people who cannot or will not share, not even the cats, and certainly by extension, certainly not the children. And when this happens to a parent, when a parent has a child turned against them, it is a pain that is both physical and psychological and one that requires tremendous courage and strength and fortitude to live with. So what I'm going to do tonight is focus on the pain uh, primarily of the alienated child who's not seen in this cartoon, um, but we know who is out there in the world being affected by this family dynamic. So the main topics I'm going to be talking about are um, what do we know about the experience of parental alienation from the perspective of the adult alienated child? And then two, um, I'm gonna provide you with some advice for targeted parents whose alienated children are adults over the age of 18 and therefore outside the purview of the courts. Um, so the advice will be about how to reach out to those children. Um, I'm gonna be talking about what we know about adult alienated children based upon um, a set of research studies um, and also based on practice wisdom um, that we have all generated over the years. Um, but I started uh, back in around 2004 or five interviewing 40 adults who had the experience of being turned against a parent by the other parent. Um, and everything I'm gonna talk about tonight um, originated in that first study, but has now been substantiated and elaborated and confirmed through additional research that's been conducted by myself and others uh, with a range of individuals uh, all across the, the, the country and even internationally. Um, when I was designing that first study, my goal was to answer what I thought were the three burning questions on every targeted parent's mind. Uh, and those three questions were, will I ever get my child back? That was the first one. Targeted parents with adult alienated children have no recourse with the courts. And certainly they're not likely to get any help from the other parent who you know, instigated the alienation to begin with. So they're really left to hope and wonder and live with the uncertainty you know, about whether or not their child will come back. And uh, in 2004, when I was designing the study, there was really no research out there to speak of to answer that very basic question. Will some of these kids grow up and figure it out and come back to the targeted parent? So that was my very first goal was to answer that question. Is there cause for hope? The second research question that I think targeted parents had, which guided my study is, what is it that allows them to have that realization process? And is there anything I can do to speed it up? Um, they wanna figure out what are the catalysts to um, children uh, figuring out that they'd been alienated and then coming back to the targeted parent. And then the third question, which is something that I think is on every targeted parent's mind is what has this experience done to my child? So when I set out to conduct that initial, that initial study, I didn't even know if there was anyone out there who would identify as an adult who had been turned against one parent by the other parent when they were a child. So embedded even in that first question, you know, I had to figure out, are there people who I could even study? Is anybody going to identify as having had that experience? 
Um, and it turned out that it really was not hard to find people who said, yeah, when I was a kid, one of my parents manipulated me to reject the other parent. Um, and so it was really not that hard to find people. And that I think is very reassuring because it means that out there in the world are people who went through alienation and at some point had the realization that they had been misled. So even before I analyzed the data, I had the answer to my first question, which is yes, some kids do come out of this. They do reconnect with the rejected parent. Now I wanna pause for a moment and say, it might seem like a sample size of 40 is small. How can I generalize from such a small sample to you know, what other people might be experiencing? And I do wanna say that actually for an, uh, the kind of research study I was doing, a sample of 40 is quite large. So small as a 40 might be a small number for certain kinds of studies, but for that first study, the way that I did it, 40 was really a fine number. But it is also important to know that um, I did follow rigorous guidelines for how to select the sample and how to analyze the data. And again, everything that I learned from that first study, and I'm going to share those findings with you, has been replicated in different kinds of research studies. So I, I think we can have a lot of confidence in these findings. So I'm going to review some of the key findings from that research, um, first identified in that small study, qualitative research of 40 adults, um, but it has been validated, all the findings have been validated using different kinds of measures and samples in the last several years. So the first finding is that parental alienation is not just the, the purview of bitter ex-wives turning kids against fathers. All right, so um, fathers can be alienating parents as well. Now, when Richard Gardner, who coined the term parental alienation, first observed the phenomenon, it was in his role as a custody evaluator and high conflict divorces. And he observed that some children seem to exhibit this odd and highly specific pattern of behaviors. And he coined that uh, parental alienation syndrome to describe this family dynamic and the behaviors that these children were engaging in. And back then in the mid 1980s, when he was first observing this, he did write that parental alienation was something that primarily mothers did to their children against their father. Now, although later he revised that statement and he was clear, fathers as well as mothers can engage in alienation and can turn children against their mothers, this is not something that has been widely understood by legal and mental health professionals. In fact, I know of situations in which mothers have tried to explain what they think is going on and they believe the father is turning the children against them only to have a legal or mental health professional dismiss their complaints because, oh, alienation is that thing that mothers do to fathers. So it can't be alienation if the mother is the rejected parent. So in my research, it is clear that fathers can engage in alienation and that mothers can lose the love and connection with their children through the alienating efforts of the father. In fact, in subsequent research studies that I've done, I would put out a call for targeted parents and in general, the people who responded were roughly 50-50 in terms of gender. Now, that doesn't mean that in the population at large that alienation is evenly divided by gender. We don't know that. And we can't know that without a different kind of research study. Um, but we can definitively say that uh, fathers can engage in alienation in addition to mothers. So um, I also found that non-custodial parents can successfully manipulate a child to unjustifiably reject the other parent. So another myth that's been corrected by this research is that PA is only engaged in by the custodial parent. My research with adult children shows that this is definitely not the case. In fact, in my own coaching practice that I now have, um, there are many parents who are custodial parents or had equal parenting and they still lost their children to alienation. Um, because what it takes is an alienating parent who is willing and able to engage in emotional manipulation. And that is unrelated to the amount of time that either parent spends with the child. Now, many targeted parents feel that if they had 50, 50 or more than that, that they would not have lost their children. And certainly the more time you, you have with your child, the more likely you are to uh, protect that relationship, but there's no uh, simple sort of rule of thumb of a certain number of hours, or if you're the custodial parent, you cannot lose cust you cannot lose your relationship with your child. 
because that's not true. Um, and then a third aspect of this first finding is that alienation can even occur in intact families. It's not just something that happens in legal divorces. In my research with adult children, some of them spoke about being turned against one parent by the other parent, even though the parents were, st were still married and living in the same home. And some of the people I interviewed and some of the people, again, in my coaching practice, they don't leave the marriage and yet parental alienation occurs anyway. And you know, sometimes my clients who are targeted parents, they say that they stay in the marriage at least to be in the same home with their children in the hopes of uh, maintaining some kind of connection. And some targeted parents say that they fear that if they leave the marriage, they'll never see their child again. Um, and this is especially true if the children are already teenagers, because as we know, the courts do not always enforce parenting time schedules once children become of a certain age. And the targeted parent knows or believes that if they move out, the children may never come visit and the courts are likely to do little about it. And again, I have many coaching clients who are staying married, firmly believing that if they ended the marriage, they would lose the relationship with their child. So with respect to this first finding, when considering if a child who has rejected a parent is alienated, the only question is whether the favored parent engaged in behaviors that resulted in the child coming to falsely believe that the other parent is unsafe, unloving, and unavailable. The gender of the parent is not relevant, the marital status of the parent is not relevant, and the legal custody parenting time schedule is not relevant for making that decision. Okay, the second finding is that the alienation was not fully internalized even by the most rejecting child. When I gave my first book talk to a parental alienation audience, several people come up to me afterwards, you know, clutching the book and saying something like page 153 saved my life. And, you know, I don't recall actually what the page number is now, but at the time I went and I looked up that page number. I wanted to know what was touching people so much. And the point that I was making on that page was that the, the adult alienated children remembered being very rude, arrogant, rejecting, and hostile towards the targeted parent back when they were children and they were alienated. But they also recalled that even while they were behaving that way, they did not fully believe what they were saying. Inside, they had their doubts about whether that parent really was as bad as, and hateful as they were saying. Inside, there was a part of them that still loved that parent. And this matters because it can help targeted parents now maintain hope that their beloved child is still in there somewhere and still loves them and needs them. So one way to think about this is the Russian nesting dolls, the doll within the doll within the doll. On the outside is a harsh wooden exterior that has a set face and it seems sort of impenetrable. But inside that doll is another doll and inside that one is another doll until you get to this tiny little doll all the way on the inside. And that's like your child. Your child is still in there. And this means that targeted parents with alienated children can, I believe, take heart that even the most negative and rejecting alienated child on some level still wants a connection with the parent who they are so actively rejecting. One of the stories from that book that I wrote that I still so vividly recall is the adult alienated woman who told me that when she was a little girl living in England, her father had visitation every Sunday. And every Sunday he would come driving to the house and he would get out of his car and he would walk up to the house and knock on the door and the girl on the other side of the door, she knew that she was not gonna be allowed out to spend time with her dad. Her mom and stepfather were holding on to her, telling her that she wasn't going to go out. And in fact, they were all standing inside the house right by the front door, yelling at the dad, we're never going to come out. We don't want to see you go away. And she told me that one Sunday, he didn't knock on the door anymore. And after that, for every Sunday from that point on, he did not come and knock on the door. And I asked her in the interview, well, what went through your mind all those times you were telling him to drop dead and go away, and then he finally stopped coming? What were you thinking? What was that like for you? And the answer that she gave me really shocked me at the time. She said she never expected him to actually stop coming and trying to see her. And in fact, she loved the knock on the door. 
She knew that she wasn't going to be allowed out by her mom and stepdad. So for her, the knock was the whole visit. It was the message that he was giving her, that he loved her and wanted to see her, and that he was making the effort because he was thinking about her. She never thought the visit was going to be any more than the knock. So for her, when he stopped coming and there were no more knocks on the door, she felt a tremendous sense of loss and sadness. So from the dad's point of view, he thought the visit was a failure because he got in his car and he drove over there and he got his hopes up and he thought about seeing his child and he drove over there and he walked up the long walkway to the front door and he knocked on the door and he was told to go away. He's a stupid idiot. Why'd he come in the first place? And then he would leave. So from his point of view, the visit was a failure. So I'm telling you this story for two reasons. And the first is, as targeted parents, you will most likely not know what is going on inside your child's heart, just like that, did, that dad did not know, that his daughter was secretly relishing the knock, knowing it was a message of love and connection. So when your child rejects you, you can entertain, or I invite you to entertain the possibility that there's more going on than you are aware of that inside your rejecting child is a child who loves you and wants to be connected with you. The second reason I'm telling you this story is because you may be reaching out and texting and sending birthday cards and doing whatever the equivalent of this father did by getting in his car and driving over and knocking on the door. And like that father, you may feel that it's a failure or a waste of time and that it's hopeless and why bother doing these things? And you, be, you may be tempted to stop doing them. And I urge you to consider what that message is when you're texting your child or sending a birthday card and how your child may be cherishing that message even if your child is not responding to you. You may feel that you're communicating in a void, but your child may likely be experiencing your efforts as way more meaningful than you can know. The third key finding is that parental alienation involves multiple losses. I used to think that alienation involved, obviously, the loss of a relationship between a parent and child. But I see now, I see it now as a series of losses. I think of an adult alienated child as a pebble in the pond with the ripples going all the way from the inner circle outwards. And at its core, parental alienation represents, represents a loss of self, of one's own truth and connection to reality, a loss of connection with your talents and interests, et cetera, associated with the targeted parent. And then outward from there, of course, there is the loss of the relationship with the targeted parent, the love and affection and nurturance and connection and social capital and skills and talents and all of that that goes with the loss of a relationship. And outward from there are losses with anyone associated with the targeted parent, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles and cousins and neighbors and friends and anybody attached to the targeted parent also is cut off from the child. So now I just wanna go back and talk a little bit about, about some of these. So in terms of loss of the self, what the adult alienated children explained to me is that the favored parent conveyed to them an intense disapproval and lack of acceptance for any way in which the child resembled or reflected the other parent. Whatever talents or interests the child had that were derived from or associated with or related to the talents and interests of the targeted parent had to be denied. So this was particularly hard for the children who physically resembled the targeted parent because they felt that their very being, their very physical presence was unacceptable. So one time I was giving a talk to a professional audience, not people who had a special interest in parental alienation. And I was talking about this sense of loss of connection to the self. And this young man stood up in the audience and said, oh my God, this is what happened to me. I never realized it. And everybody in the audience turned to look at him. And it was clear there was something very unusual about his appearance. And he explained that growing up, his mother hated his father, every aspect of his father. 
he explained that he happened to physically resemble his father, who was from a different ethnic background than the mother. And not only was he male, and so he looked more like the father than the mother, but his, his features resembled the father more. And this young man explained that he felt compelled to seek plastic surgery and that he had in fact had numerous plastic surgeries on his face to change literally his appearance. And we could see that he had literally cut off pieces of his face. He did not look healthy or normal. And he explained that the purpose was to change his appearance enough so that he would not look like his father. And it's important to note that his mother never told him, as far as I know, you have to have plastic surgery. You have to cut off your face in order to be loved by me. The plastic surgery was his solution to the problem of not being able to tolerate a part of himself that his mother despised. Less extreme versions of this include not feeling that it's okay to be grumpy in the morning if the other parent was grumpy in the morning, or not feeling that it's okay to be interested in a certain profession or hobby because it's associated with the other parent. In a very real sense, when adult children reunify with the targeted parent, they are also reunifying with themselves. By coming to the realization that they've been manipulated by one parent to unjustifiably reject the other, they are reconnecting not just with the targeted parent, but with all the parts of themselves that they had to cut off or bury or deny. But as we know, parental alienation is not just the loss of a relationship with the self, and it's not just the loss of a relationship with the targeted parent, but it's also a loss of the relationship with the friends and family of the targeted parent, such as formerly beloved grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and neighbors who are cut off as well. And so there are multiple relationships that become you know, collateral damage basically to parental alienation. To be clear, the loss of these relationships is not just a loss of the emotional connection, but it's the loss of the social connections that the targeted parent or his or her family could provide to the child. It's a loss sometimes of financial resources that these people can provide. The privileges, connections, and assets that all of these people can provide to the child. In this way, parental alienation represents multiple ongoing losses that can profoundly shape and affect the child's life well into adulthood. The next finding is that alienating parents function like cult leaders and they use some of the same strategies that cult leaders use to effectuate the alienation. Now, although many people still have not heard of parental alienation, everybody pretty much has heard about cults. You know, the phrase to drink the Kool-Aid is part of our common parlance based on what happened in Jonestown. So it can be helpful to talk about parental alienation as cult-like because it's a useful heuristic for understanding alienation. And there are many benefits to using the cult analogy, especially for the adult children who feel so ashamed and embarrassed and guilty when they come out of the parental alienation dynamic and they realize what they've done, they can comfort themselves through the understanding that many people fall sway to powerful manipulators who do not have their best interest at heart. And with a cult leader, uh, the leader is not an actual parent who already has so much built-in credibility and power and authority over a child. So, you know, no one wakes up one morning and says, oh, you know, today is the day I'm going to shave my head and I'm going to give away all my money and I'm going to give away all my belongings and I'm going to cut off my friends and family because what I really, really want to do is stand in an airport for 18 hours a day selling flowers for a nickel so, you know, the guru can have another Rolls Royce, right? Nobody, you know, says that. And yet it happens, doesn't it? Right? So the co-litter can manipulate people to get to that point where they give up everything. And the cult leader, again, is not even a parent, right? Uh, they don't have the authority built in the way the favored parent does. Um, parents have inherent power and control and authority over their children. So talking about alienation as a kind of cult, what I refer to as the cult of parenthood, 
can be helpful for people who are trying to wrap their minds around what's happening in this family. It's a kind of shorthand. When you talk about a cult, everybody understands. Somebody has fallen under the sway of somebody who's manipulating them to do things that aren't in their best interest. So for somebody who's trying to wrap their mind around what's happening in this family, talking about it as a cult can be useful and it's helpful for the adult child of parental alienation to think about it as a cult because it helps them feel, you know, not as embarrassed by the choice they've made. You know, gee, if some person, you know, gives away everything to become basically enslaved to some random, you know, not family member, well, then what, I, what happened to me isn't so, you know, outside the norm. So one of the ways in which parental alienation is like a cult is that cult leaders and alienating parents use some of the same emotional manipulation and thought reform strategies to induce the individual to relinquish their independence and critical thinking and place that cult leader or the favorite parent in a position of ultimate authority in their life. So one of the strategies is called black-white thinking. So favorite parents and cult leaders use black-white thinking to create a stark contrast between them and everybody else, right? So it's the favorite parent's way of doing things is, you know, always the good way. It's always the right way. You either are in or you're out. You're on board with the favorite parent or you're not. You're either accepted, you know, or you're not. You have to have faith and trust in that parent or you don't. There's very little room for doubt or nuance or questioning. The favorite parent wants the child to subvert his separateness, his independence, his own thinking, and hand over the reins to the parent. And that's the same thing that cult leaders do. Another similarity is the creation of what's called a milieu, which is an environment over which the parent or the cult leader has total control. Now, cults do this by locating the cult in a specific setting. It's usually isolated. People are not allowed on and off the premises. There's no newspapers or radio or TV on the premises. So the only source of information that's available to the cult member is provided by the cult leader. So generally favored parents can not exercise that level of control. They might like to, but generally they don't um, unless they isolate the child and homeschool them but they can try to limit the influence of other people on the child, obviously, especially the targeted parent. Alienating parents often control the flow of information from the targeted parent uh, when the child is with them. And in some cases, the alienating parent doesn't allow the child to wear clothes or have any items connected with the targeted parent. Another strategy common between alienating parents and cult leaders is bad-mouthing anyone associated with the other side. For cult leaders, uh, that's anyone not in the cult, and for alienating parents, that's the targeted parent and his or her friends and family. The message conveyed to the child is that the world is made up of two teams, us and them, and everyone is either for them or against them. To disagree or see things differently means the person is bad and harmful. And this creates a sense of fear and resentment in the child towards the targeted parent and a belief that only the favored parent can really protect and love them and know them and what is right and good for them. Um, and that just to link that back to creating dependency is what does create the dependency on the favored parent is the child believing that only that parent loves them and understands them. And then the other uh, common strategy between cult leaders and alienating parents is alternating between extreme positive affirmation and cold, harsh rejection. So for the cult member, this is called love bombing. When someone is first experiencing the cult, and often a new member doesn't know it's a cult, they just think they're hanging out with some really cool new friends who seem really excited and really into them. Um, that new member is treated as hit as if he were the most interesting, wonderful person in the world. And he gets sucked into the cult little by little. First, it might be a weekend seminar that he goes to, and then maybe a week long treat, uh, retreat, and everyone seems so happy to see him and so positive and amazed at what he says and thinks. And over time, the new cult member becomes hooked on all that positive regard and is willing to make sacrifices to keep that positive energy flowing his way. He may cancel plans with other people to keep hanging out with these new friends. And he may make increasing time commitments to be with these new people and learn about their views on the world. 
and the cult leader in particular will shower the new member with positive regard and keen interest and attention. Eventually, once the member is hooked into the cult, making incremental sacrifices and increasing commitments, then the cult members, and especially the cult leader, can control him through withdrawing that love and attention, being disappointed in him, creating a sense of anxiety and fear about the loss of that relationship. And that is when the new member is willing to make even greater sacrifices and commitments. And then once he's back in the good graces of the cult, the new member feels tremendous relief that he hasn't lost the love and approval of the leader. So he's primed to make even more sacrifices and commitments to keep the love coming his way. Alienating parents function in very much the same way. The adult children I interviewed talked about how the favored parents showered them with intense love and approval and made them feel as if they couldn't survive without that love and approval. So the parents would say things like, where would you be without me? And I'm the only one who really understands you and gets you. And eventually the child comes to believe that without the love and approval of the favored parent, he's not really real and he's not really loved or truly understood. And it is when the parent then pulls back and becomes cold and distant that the child feels such an intense need to win back that parent's love, the child will do anything, sacrifice anything, including the love and affection of the other parent. One adult child I spoke to said, I would give up everything for my daddy. And at the time she didn't really question, why would daddy be asking her to give up everything? So the connection between cults and parental alienation is a strong connection with many parallels. And I've just talked about one of them, which is that cult leaders and alienating parents use some of the same strategies. And so understanding cults can help us understand how it is that a parent can turn, again, turn a child against the other parent. If an adult can be turned against his or her friends and family by a perfect stranger, as with cults, Certainly a child with a whole lot less developed critical thinking skills to combat the manipulation can be manipulated by a parent who has inherent power and authority and control over the child. When I finished writing that first book based on the interviews with the adult children of parental alienation, I sent a copy of the book to each of the 40 people I interviewed. And I spoke with some of them afterwards about their reactions to reading the book and their thoughts about what I thought and said about their experiences. And many of them commented that it was so interesting to read the part where I compared their experience to being in a cult. They felt excited about the comparison because they felt it gave them a way to think about what was happening that was less shameful than, I'm a terrible person who was such an idiot for believing when what, what one parent said to me about the other parent. Instead, they could say, I had an experience that, that's like being in a cult. I was manipulated by a devious person who lied to me and tricked me into believing something that wasn't true. Lots of people have had this experience. I'm not the only one. And they also felt that talking about cults helped them to explain to other people what they had been through. It was sort of an easy shorthand because, you know, everyone knows about cults and most people understand it's possible to be tricked and manipulated by a cult leader. So the cult analogy is also helpful for thinking about escape and recovery. In the cult world, it's understood that there are three ways to get out of a cult. So, you know, let's start with the basics that people are really not free to leave a cult. They are physically kept in the location of the cult, often by force. There are many cults that have, you know, armed gunmen on the perimeter of the compound, for example. So there are three ways to get out. The first is to be kicked out of the cult. This uh, does actually happen sometimes, and often it's a tool for keeping everyone else in line. If someone who didn't want to leave the cult was kicked out, the cult members would see someone begging to stay, terrified to leave, willing to do anything to get back in the good graces of the cult leader. And seeing this would actually reinforce for everyone else how terrible it would be to leave and it would make everyone else hunker down and become more committed than ever to the cult leader. So I think many alienated kids have actually witnessed the alienating parent cutting off somebody. There's a lot of cutoffs in the families of alienators. It might be a friend, a colleague, or a family member, somebody who crossed them in some way. 
And this often had the effect of making the child more scared of going against what the alienating parent said or wanted because they'd seen that parent cut off somebody coldly and you know, wash their hands of them. So the people who are kicked out of the cult are not the people who really want to leave. Um, they're really just a tool to make everybody else more afraid of leaving. But some people are kicked out of a cult. That is one way to get out. The second way to get out of a cult is to literally escape. Um, and this is often not possible and it's often dangerous for cult members. And you know, it's not exactly relevant for alienated kids, except that prior to escaping the cult, the cult member has to come to the internal realization that he wants to get out. So that's the part that's relevant for alienation. This usually does not happen overnight. It is a slow process of considering doubts about the cult, beginning to see that things are not all that they're cracked up to be, missing the outside world, wanting to have more self-direction and agency in one's life, seeing that the cult leader is a hypocrite. It is this process of internal movement away from unquestioning adoration that is analogous for alienated kids who are severely alienated, who appear to be totally devoted to the favored parent, thinking that that parent is the most wonderful, amazing, special, perfect person in the whole world. So one of the things that I focus on in my coaching of targeted parents is how to help their children have a more nuanced, balanced, less black, white, less us, them view of the world, including being able to see some of the ways in which uh, the child may not agree with the alienating parent and some of the ways in which the targeted parent may not be all that bad. So what I learned about cult manipulations can actually help us understand how to strategically prevent and intervene with alienated children. So the third way to get out of a cult is to be counseled out. So when the cult boom happened in the 60s and 70s, the way that family members got their cult member you know, the people that they knew in their family who got sucked into a cult, how they got them out was by kidnapping them out of the cult and debriefing them. This often involved keeping the cult member in a hotel room and being screamed at for days on end by a person, you know, some hired gun hotshot who's brought in to, you know, like uh, convince the cult member that the, that the leader, you know, really was out to hurt them. Um, now, things have really evolved since then. And what happens now um, is a lot less forceful and more nuanced. They don't call it exit. Um, oh, I can't even think of the name of what it used to be called, but it, now it's called something else. And the thinking is that it really has to be more sort of subtle and less sort of violent and um, where the person doesn't feel like they're losing control quite so much and locked into a you know into a hotel room for a week. It's really not any different from a cult, right? Um, so things have evolved since then. And what happens now is you know a less forceful version of that more nuanced approach to sparking within the cult member a desire, a desire to know the truth and to reconnect with that part of what all humans have, which is a desire for self-direction. Now, all that has been learned about that process of working with cult members who are being exited out of a cult has been folded into the work of alienated children. And the lessons learned from working with former cult members really has been woven into, for example, the Family Bridges program. So the final way in which the cult analogy is helpful for understanding adult children of parental alienation is through the overlap in the long-term effects of parental alienation. And it turned out that they're very comparable to the long-term effects of being in a cult. And I'm gonna get back to this in a little bit. All right, so one of the things that most surprised me when I was first conducting interviews with the adult children of parental alienation was that the favored parent, the parent the child was aligned with, the parent the child was ardently adoring, so desperately clinging to, that parent in many cases, certainly not all, was physically and or sexually abusing the child. I was not, I really just wasn't prepared to hear about the brutal violations of the child's sense of safety and security, 
by the parent the child was bonded to. Now I understand that children who are abused by a parent will generally cling to that parent, but at the time I did not understand this phenomenon. And uh, for those who want to know more about this, you know, one of my books is called Bonded to the Abuser. And so I really dug into this phenomenon. Um, and in that book, I describe and review, I think it's four, somewhere between 45 and 50 memoirs written by adults who, when they were children, were physically, sexually, or emotionally abused by a parent. And in all cases, that abused child was enamored by the abusive parent. And this is what happens in alienation situations. When the alienating parent physically or sexually abused the child, it did not result in the child thinking, well, I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. I don't feel safe. I'm gonna get out of here so I can go and be with my other parent who doesn't treat me badly. Nope, that is not what they thought. What they did think was, I'm a bad person. I deserve this treatment. It's my fault that this parent is doing this to me. And in order for me to feel good about myself, I need to try to win back the love and approval of that parent. So the physical or sexual or emotional abuse didn't result in the child wanting to get out of there. It actually strengthened the child's commitment to that parent and devotion to that parent. And this is not an accident. Now, I'm not saying that the alienating parents abuse their children in order to induce the children to be more committed to them. But what I am saying is that when parents abuse their children, the parents do not say to the child, I'm out of control, I'm a monster, I'm doing terrible things to you. No, what the parent is saying is, look what you made me do to you. If you weren't so bad, I wouldn't have to do this to you. And so when parents abuse their child, they reinforce in the child the belief that the child is responsible for the abuse. And so the child does not turn against the abusive parent, the child turns against himself. Now this is very important to understand because it's counterintuitive, meaning it goes against how we think the world works. And certainly if the targeted parent tries to explain to the courts or to mental health professionals that the other parent is abusive, it's really hard for those professionals to believe that that's the case, given how enthralled the child seems to be with that parent. Many professionals do not understand that children who are abused cling to the abuser because of this process of becoming bonded to an abusive parent, and it is not a widely understood process. So as I mentioned just now, alienating parents are by definition engaging in uh, psychological maltreatment, okay, emotional abuse of their children. And that is to say that to turn a child against a parent is emotionally abusive to a child above and beyond the other kinds of abuse that the favored parent might be engaging in, physical abuse or sexual abuse. All of them, by definition, are engaging in psychological maltreatment simply because they're engaging in alienation. Okay. So I want to explain the three ways in which alienation is a form of psychological maltreatment. So the first is the 17 primary parental alienation strategies constitute a form of psychological maltreatment because the 17 behaviors result in the child feeling worthless and unloved. And that is the fundamental sort of definition of psychological maltreatment. And I, by the way, I may use the term emotional abuse or psychological maltreatment, I'm using them synonymously. The 17 strategies convey to the child that the other parent is unsafe, unloving and unavailable, that the other parent doesn't really value or cherish or care for the child. That is the message that the child is getting through the 17 primary parental alienation strategies that the favored parent is engaging in. And when children come to believe that a parent does not love them, they naturally internalize that there's something unlovable about them. It's hard for children to think about this any other way because developmentally they are egocentric. That does not mean by the way that they are narcissistic. 
okay? Egocentric means, uh, so it, they're not narcissistic, meaning they have a sense of grandiosity and entitlement and preoccupation with their own perspective and needs to the exclusion of others. Egocentric means that they think that they are the cause of all the actions that happen to them. You know, everybody knows the classic example of the child who spills his mil milk at dinner one night and the next day the parents tell him they're getting a divorce and he thinks it's because he spilled the milk. So when the alienating parent is telling the child through these 17 behaviors that the other parent, you know, the other parent doesn't really love you, they don't really care about you, what the child takes in, the message the child takes in is, I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough. And um, that is psychological maltreatment. So the second way that parental alienation is a form of psychological maltreatment, meaning that it negatively affects the child's experience of himself, is that the 17 behaviors convey to the child, not just that the other parent doesn't love the child, but that there's some, something fundamentally wrong with that other parent, okay? That there's, you know, the parent is contemptuous. Everything they do is wrong and stupid and less than. Their family is bad. Their job is bad. Their values are bad. And when children think that there's something fundamentally wrong with the parent, they internalize that. They take in, gee, there must be something wrong with me, right? Because uh, parents are inside of ourselves, right? So you, through biology or genetics or through shared experiences and influences. So when a child is encouraged to believe one of your parents is disgusting and damaged, there's something wrong with them and everything they do and say and think and believe the children come to believe there must be something wrong with me. In fact, one of the papers that I wrote is called to turn a child against a parent is to turn a child against himself. And that again is the essence of psychological maltreatment. And the third way that parental alienation is a form of psychological maltreatment is that the child experiences the love and affection and approval of the favored parent as conditioned on the child doing everything that parent wants, including rejecting, sometimes hostily rejecting the other parent. And although the child might not be aware of it, the child absorbs the message that the favored parent's love is conditional as opposed to unconditional. Uh, so when, when I interviewed the adults who lived through this, um, when they were children, they said things like, mom would only love me if I showed her how much I hated my father. Right? And for a child to believe that a parent's love has such a high price, the loss of a relationship with the other parent, the child experiences themselves as unloved, worthless, and only of value in meeting someone's needs. And again, that's the overarching definition of psychological maltreatment. So I first wrote about this connection between alienation and psychological maltreatment after talking to the adults who were alienated as children. And now, since then, I've studied this relationship between alienation and mal psychological maltreatment uh, more systematically in numerous research studies using different measures of alienation and different measures of psychological maltreatment with different samples. And in each and every study, there was a strong, meaningful, and statistically significant association between exposure to alienation and the experience of being psychologically maltreated by the parent who was engaging in the alienation. Okay, the next finding is one I've already alluded to. Alienation is associated with many long-term negative effects for the children that last well into adulthood. So research on adult children of parental alienation indicates that long-term negative effects are likely to be caused by the loss of a relationship due to alienation. And according to the adults who were alienated from one parent by the other, there were numerous negative long-term effects from this experience. So the first is uh, children who are pressured to and eventually reject a parent due to alienation uh, will suffer in terms of their identity development. And this is a critical component of an individual's sense of self. You know, who am I? Am I a good person? Um, children who are cut off from a parent because of alienation often develop problems related to their identity and their sense of self. And these problems tend to center around certain core themes. So the first is the child is aware that the favored parent has no respect for the disfavored parent, the rejected parent, 
So it's no leap for the child who's raised with a steady stream of complaints and criticisms about the other parent to conclude that no aspect of that parent can be allowed expression within him or herself. All similarities with that parent must be eradicated because the child does not want to be found unacceptable by the remaining parent. So they can't risk appearing to be similar to the rejected parent in any way. And so these children will go to great lengths to expunge any aspect of the other parent from them. And as I mentioned, appearances might be changed, names are changed, personality characteristics that resemble the rejected parent will be eliminated, values, beliefs, and talents that evoke or resemble that other parent will be suppressed or denied. So identification with a parent is a natural part of the human psychology. Children generally admire and love their parents, even ones who are less than adequate. And as children mature, they incorporate aspects of their parents' values, tastes, and sensibilities into their own identity. So children, to a great extent, are an amalgamation of their parents. But for alienated children, the task of identity development becomes compromised by the struggle to figure out, how do I create an identity that will be acceptable to one parent but cannot reflect any aspects of the other parent which is inside me. In addition, children raised under a, you know, a family dynamic of alienation, they're not free to arrive at an authentic identity. Um, they're not free to explore all the aspects of who they are. They have to only allow the parts that are acceptable by the favored parent. The next type of long-term negative outcome is serious problems developing healthy adult romantic relationships. And this is so for a couple of reasons. So first, in order to manage the normal ups and downs of any intimate relationship, one has to have a strong sense of one's own core values and beliefs in order to know, when should I be flexible here? You know, uh, when should I, but when should I resist the urge to accommodate? Who am I as a person and what are my, you know, boundaries and what are the lines I'm not willing to cross? What am I willing to give up to maintain a relationship and what is so essential to who I am that I would not give it up? But people raised by an alienating parent are likely to overcompensate in terms of pleasing the other person. I mean, that's the relationship that they had with the favored parent. That's their template or blueprint of a relationship. And often this happens at the expense of their own needs and happiness. An extreme version of this is codependency, which occurs when one person expends excessive emotional energy, time, and money on others rather than functioning as an equal partner in a relationship. Parental alienation is a form of codependency and that the child experiences the favored parent as dependent on them, uh, you know, to reject the disfavored parent. Thus, they are primed for replicating these types of relationships later in life. Moreover, adult alienated children generally have not been taught how to properly manage conflict and how to work through interpersonal difficulties. Favored parents do not teach or foster in their children forgiveness conflict management, and critical thinking skills. Thus, typically, these children have an impaired ability to resolve interpersonal conflict. Favored parents want their children to be obedient, compliant, and reflexive in their support for them, while at the same time inflexible and demanding in their relationship with the targeted parent. And both of these relationship stances are maladaptive if extreme, right? And it can lead to dysfunctional behaviors in the child's future relationships. So there's good reason to believe that when they become adults, these children are having, they're substantially at risk for divorce themselves, for example. Alienated children have been taught to devalue, walk away and cut off people rather than work through difficult and conflicted situations. The favored parent encourages the children to think nothing of being cruel towards the disfavored parent, an attitude that if transferred to adult relationships can certainly be quite problematic. In addition, alienated children are usually encouraged, if not expected, to reject the extended family of the targeted parent, people with whom the children have long-standing relationships. Alienated children are encouraged to not respond or be appreciative of cards and gifts, not to return phone calls, 
respond to invitations, not to attend important once in a lifetime family events, not to exhibit the normal gratitude and appreciation for gifts and so forth. This cold and unfeeling behavior cannot be completely compartmentalized. The lesson that children are learning is that it's acceptable to walk away from people no matter how little reason there is to do so and regardless of how great the pain and inconvenience it will cause others. And this attitude can make it difficult for them to sustain healthy adult relationships. Because adult alienated children have been taught to fear the disapproval of the favored parent and have been encouraged to think that the targeted parent rejected them, they're often quite fearful of rejection and abandonment. And because of this, they may cling to unhealthy relationships at all costs or be provocative in their attempt to confirm that they are unlovable and unworthy of love. Their over-dependence on the approval of the favored parent will likely interfere with their ability to develop the emotional strength they will need to forge healthy adult relationships. And these associations between alienation and difficulties with adult romantic relationships not only emerged in the, that interview study that I did, but they've been empirically supported in research studies in which exposure to parental alienation strategies in childhood is associated with a greater likelihood of what's called an insecure attachment style in adulthood. So not surprisingly, exposure to parental alienation has also been associated with depression in adulthood. It used to be assumed that depression in adulthood is caused by an early loss, such as abandonment or death of a parent. <clears throat> but our understanding has really evolved since then, so it's not loss per se that's associated with depression, but rather the inability to mourn the loss and make sense of the loss. You know, when a parent dies, and yes, that is obviously a terrible thing for a child, usually the child can process that loss and make sense of it. The remaining parent will show the child pictures of the deceased parent and share memories of that parent. They may visit that parent's grave and find ways to incorporate the lost parent into their hearts and minds. But with alienation, the child has to contend with the loss all on his or her own. Usually there are no pictures of that parent, no fond remembrances, no visits with the friends and family of that parent. And of course the child knows that the parent is still alive. And so the child's not really able to make sense of what happened to the relationship. The best story I can think of to explain this is Robin, one of the people I interviewed for the first study. Robin came home from school one day as a little boy, seven years old, and in his living room was a man he didn't know. His mother introduced him to this man by saying, this is your new daddy. And Robin asked his mother, well, what happened to the man who used to be my father? And she said, oh, he was a bad man and he's gone. This is your new daddy now. And from that point forward, he was never allowed to talk about the man who used to be his daddy. And what's so incredible to me about this story is that he instantly knew he was forbidden to even mention by name his father. And so for the rest of his childhood, he didn't talk about him, the man who used to be his daddy. And Robin had a tough, a tough childhood. Uh, the new father actually beat him and didn't love him. And Robin had a hard time as an adult. He basically tried to kill himself with drugs and alcohol, which he attributes to the pain of the loss, the inexplicable loss of the man who used to be his father. And when he was an adult and in a drug rehab program, he received a letter from his father who had hired a private detective to track him down. Eventually they got together and when they did meet for the first time, the father handed him a birthday card that the father had sent to him when he was a little boy of seven, which the mother had intercepted. She had written on the envelope, you know, return to sender. And the father held onto that card all those years and he handed that card to adult Robin. And Robin shared with me that it was a very powerful healing moment for him. And it helped him really turn his life around. But what he said was that he could never go back in time to reassure that little seven-year-old boy who thought his daddy didn't even remember him on his birthday. He couldn't go back in time and tell that little boy, your daddy does love you. Robin said there was no way to undo all those years of feeling unloved by a parent. And not just unloved by a parent, but unable to talk about that feeling with his mother. He was alone as a little boy to deal with such a big and confusing and painful experience. 
And that is what led to his pain and sadness. Another aspect of depression related to parental alienation is the experience of intense guilt and shame that the adult children have once they have the realization that they had unnecessarily rejected and lost a relationship with the targeted parent. Many of the adult children I interviewed were called specific moments when they broke the heart of the other parent and they were haunted by the knowledge that they had been participants, active participants in causing somebody who they had loved and who loved them to feel so much pain. They remembered specific moments when they told that parent to drop dead and go away and don't come to my school play or my sweet 16 or my birthday party or my graduation or my wedding. And although they knew on some level that they had been manipulated to hurt that parent, they still felt responsible for the pain that they had caused that parent. And because they didn't really understand the manipulation tactics of the alienating parent, they did feel responsible for their own behavior and that led them to feel guilty and ashamed and depressed because they had no way to understand the whole process of parental alienation and the role that the other parent played in their rejection of the targeted parent. And as was reflected in Robin's story, there also seems to be an association with parental alienation as a child and having substance abuse issues as a young adult. And I understand this um, based on what the interviewee shared with me, that it was an attempt to escape the pain, to numb themselves from the feelings of pain and loss they felt as children. The loss of the parent, the loss of self-esteem, the pain from the conflict that they had with the favored parent who was demanding that they give up the other parent, all of that was just being numbed with drugs and alcohol. The final negative outcome that I wanna talk about that's associated with alienation is difficulties transitioning from childhood to becoming a self-sufficient adult. Many of the people I interviewed did not separate emotionally or physically, geographically from the favored parent. They tended to live at home, even as adults perhaps going to like community college, but many of them stayed within the orbit of the favored parent, living with them, working with them, having that parent take care of their child, or you know, somehow keeping their, their claws into, you know, into the child. They did not have adequate life skills. They didn't know how to do laundry, cook, clean, manage money, read a map, basic skills you need to separate and function as an adult. And this is very understandable in light of the cult analogy. So there's a saying in the cult world, what do you get if an 18 year old joins a cult for 10 years, what do you get at the end when the eight, when the, at the end of the 10 years, when that person leaves the cult? And what you have is an 18 year old because during the 10 years that that person was in a cult, that person did not learn life skills, critical thinking skills, how to navigate the world as a separate autonomous free thinking individual. And something similar happens with alienated children in that the favorite parent wants the child to stay within that parent's orbit of influence, wants that child to stay dependent. Okay, so there's a recap. There's the identity development and low self-esteem, difficulties with adult relationships, depression and shame, drug abuse, and difficulties becoming self-sufficient. Okay, um, so I do want to say, um, you know, if you're a targeted parent and you have an adult alienated child, it doesn't necessarily mean that your child is gonna have any of these. It certainly doesn't mean they're gonna have all of these negative experiences. So, you know, while the research does show that there are these statistical associations between alienation and some of these poor outcomes, it certainly isn't um, a guarantee it's not like 100% of the children had these experiences. So I just want you to bear that in mind. Yes, alienation is bad news for kids, but your particular child isn't necessarily gonna have each and every one of these experiences or maybe not even any of them. Okay, the next finding I wanna talk about is that alienating parents probably have personality disorders, notably narcissistic, borderline, or antisocial. 
When I conducted the first research study interviewing adults who lived through alienation as children, you know, I was struck by how they consistently spoke about the favorite parent in such glowing terms uh, when they were talking about how they felt about that person as a child. They spoke about being enthralled with that parent. That parent was brilliant and beautiful and magical and wonderful and so charming and powerful and believable. And, you know, if you read between the lines of what they're saying, it really did sound a lot like a cluster B personality disorder, such as narcissism, borderline, or antisocial personality. And, you know, it makes sense in that people with these personality disorders tend to have a magnetic, compelling personality that draws people to them. And that's part of their ability to persuade and manipulate people. It also makes sense in terms of their fundamental lack of empathy you know, that does go along with these personality disorders. And that's partly what allows the alienator to do what they do. Another aspect of parental uh, personality disorders and parental alienation is a imperviousness to feedback. Many people with these personality disorders cannot be persuaded or shown that there is another perspective, that there might be another way to think about what's going on. They tend to have tremendous self-confidence in their perspective and their point of view. And so if you tell an alienating parent, you know, what you're doing is really harming your child and you may even, may even result in your child being hurt and angry with you later when they figure out what you've done, they're not going to believe you. They only put stock in their felt experience and their perspective. And this is partly what makes it so hard for a targeted parent to co-parent with them. They're convinced that they're right all the time. They're not interested in anyone else's point of view. They're intractable. <coughs> and another element of people with these personality disorders is that they generally make a very good first impression. You know, they're composed, charming, calm, cool, and collected. They know how to draw people in. They're very likable. They're compelling. You know, they can hide the entitlement and arrogance and lack of respect for authority of other people. And so if the legal or mental health professionals are interacting with both parents, it's the alienating parent who makes a better impression than the targeted parent. And people with these personality disorders attract other people because, you know, unless you're in an intimate relationship with them, they can be like charming and delightful. And so it's hard for the child to get an accurate sense of, you know, who is this person when everybody else seems to be so enamored with them? And finally, there's a lack of respect for the authority of other people that's common among alienating parents and people with these personality disorders. You know, a sense that the rules don't apply to them. They're not likely to follow court orders or respect what a therapist is saying or feel compelled to hold up their end of, you know, their end of an agreement. You know, never switch a schedule with, a, with an alienating parent, you know, such as, well, you can have the kids this weekend and then I'll have them next weekend because I can guarantee you they're going to take, but they will not give, all right? Because they don't really care about anybody but themselves and the rules do not apply to them. All right, let's talk about some good news here. Some of these kids come back on their own. And I want to point out that when I conducted this first study, there was no parent coaching for targeted parents. There were no support groups. There was no family access conferences and webinars. There was very little way for targeted parents to get support or guidance from each other. And a lot of the feedback they're probably getting from lawyers and therapists was bad. There was no parental alienation immersion programs. So my point is, that the, today there's a lot more knowledge and support for targeted parents to help them navigate the PA world. So there's a much better chance that people know how to protect their relationships with their kids before they become too alienated. Um, and so even without all the benefits that we now have for targeted parents, all the resources and knowledge that's available now, even back then, some of these targeted parents got their kids back. <clears throat> so there's a couple points I wanna make about the reconciliation process. The first is, it was pretty hard for them to come to the realization that one parent had lied to them and manipulated them and that they felt that they'd been so stupid and gullible to believe what they'd been told. And of course they felt shame and guilt for what they put the parent through. So there is a huge price to pay for having the realization. 
for many, you know, they also lost the relationship with the alienating parent who couldn't tolerate being challenged or having to share their child with the other parent. You know, and this isn't a surprise uh, to the adult children because they knew, you know, the favorite parent was a my way or highway kind of person. And yet it still hurt when the parent turned on them, put them down or cut them off. So it was hard to come to the realization. And yet they were all grateful that they had the truth and that many things started to make more sense to them once they opened their eyes to what was really going on. And as I said, there was a tremendous sense of guilt that alienated children felt over the treatment of the targeted parent. I mentioned earlier, many could recall specific moments, a specific look on the face of the parent when the child was rejecting them. And they felt really badly. These moments were seared into their mind once they were able to accept you know, what the reality was. They also felt a tremendous sense of sadness about the time lost with the targeted parent. They could recall trips they didn't take, meals they didn't share, events they didn't partake in, and felt that some of these things could never be made up for, even after they reconnected with the parent. There were holes in the fabric of the relationship that could never be fully closed. At least that's what they believed. And this was especially true for those whose targeted parents had died, or aged considerably during the period of no contact. I do wanna also say that there are multiple catalysts, meaning forced to make something happen for the alienated child to rethink his or her childhood. There are many different ways that these kids come around and they feel compelled to reconnect with the targeted parent. And at the same time, there is no magic bullet for uh, making that happen. There was no one catalyst that led everybody to have the same realization. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about the catalyst. So again, the good news is there are multiple catalysts to having the realization that one parent manipulated you to unjustifiably reject the other parent. And the first was simply maturation. So one part of normal development is to question the values and beliefs of one's family of origin and questioning the statements made by the favored parent about the targeted parent is one aspect of a larger process of separating that is developmentally a part of our life journey when we become teenagers. Um, in addition, the physical and eventual financial separation that comes with reaching adulthood for many, also enhances an individual's capacity to tolerate psychological distance from the alienating parent. Furthermore, increased time spent observing other families and other ways that people interact with their spouses and ex-spouses and children also contributed to the maturational process that allowed for the realization. The adult children whom I interviewed talked about a slow and steady process of coming to be aware that the alienating parent didn't have all the answers, didn't know everything. It didn't always have to be their way. And they became aware that that parent had an agenda to keep them from the other parent. But these people who talked about the catalyst in this way, they couldn't pinpoint a particular moment. It was little grains of sand accumulating to tip the scale in the direction of truth. The second catalyst is that the alienating parent turned on the child. For these adult children who I interviewed, the precipitating impetus for the realization was that the alienating parent turned on them and became hostile or intensely controlling towards them. These alienating parents revealed their true relational style over time as they began to treat the child in the same manipulative fashion that they treated the targeted parent. And without the targeted parent in the picture anymore, for the alienating parent to focus all their rage and need to control on, the alienating parent turned their animosity and need for power and control on the children. And then these kids had a taste of being on the receiving end of this. And they're like, oh, you know, I don't really like this. Maybe this is, maybe this is what happened with the targeted parent. Maybe they were victimized in the same way. The third is becoming a, a targeted parent themselves. And this served as a catalyst for some of the adult children by helping them realize that what they were experiencing was comparable to what their own targeted parent had gone through. 
And making that, a, that connection allowed them to rethink much of what they had been told about the targeted parent. In other words, a, a child is, let's say, alienated from dad by mom, grows up to marry somebody like their mom, and they become divorced. And then that woman turns the kids against them. And they're like, wow, my kids are saying things to me that sound like what I said to my dad. Or, you know, they started to see the parallel. And that helped them come to the realization. The next catalyst is specific in situations in which the targeted parent was like legally cut out and then allowed to return and the child was able to have access to that parent and experience them in an authentic way and to take in the reality that that parent was not the toxic person that the alienating parent had portrayed them to be. The fifth catalyst was the adult child attaining a significant milestone in their life that allowed them, um, you know, just the maturity or the some kind of connection went off for them. So, um, for example, Mark, he was one of the people I interviewed. He recalled his mother engaging in extensive bad mouthing about the father. And even though his parents remained married, he had little to do with his dad. He actually said, I hardly knew him. Um, but then some milestone happened in Mark's life and it just sparked in him a, hmm, I'd like to get to know that guy. And he reconnected and, and on his own terms realized, oh, this, you know, nothing my mother told me about this guy really turned out to be true. Um, so being in therapy was a catalyst for some of the adult children, even when they did not go to therapy specifically to talk about family conflict. In fact, uh, one of the people I interviewed said she went to therapy. Her therapist asked her, oh, like, oh, your parents are divorced. What was that like? And she said, oh, I'm one of the lucky ones. My parents' divorce didn't affect me at all. But, you know, over time, through the process of therapy and exploring her childhood and her relationships with each parent, she came to the realization with the, with the support of the therapist that, in fact, one of her parents had manipulated her to unjustifiably reject the other parent. Seventh, uh, the next catalyst is the intervention of an extended family member. For one of the people I interviewed, for example, his mother was the alienating parent. And one day she allowed him to have a phone call with the uh, paternal grandfather. And when he got on the phone, the grandfather was crying, saying, I can't believe it. I'm finally able to talk to you after all these years. I've missed you so much. And he talked about all the fun things they had done together. And this got the boy thinking that if his grandfather had been looking for him, maybe his father had been looking for him as well. And he realized his mother had changed his last name and moved several states, and this is before the internet. So it, you know, he couldn't think, oh, my father could easily find me. He was like, hmm, maybe my father really did try to reach me and couldn't. And that sparked in him a realization that maybe he shouldn't be angry at his father for abandoning him, Maybe his father was missing him and trying to find him. And that actually turned out to be the case. The next catalyst uh, for the realization is the intervention of a significant other, a boyfriend, for example, um, a boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse, you know, who looks at the situation a little more objectively than the adult alienated child and can say, you know, I think there's more to the story here you know, maybe your mom isn't as bad as you say. I mean, wow, my mom did way worse than you're telling me what your mom did to you. And I still talk to my mom. And because the adult alienated child loves this person and feels safe in this relationship, there's a receptivity to reevaluate the situation from this new perspective. Another catalyst is seeing the alienating parent mistreat other people. Uh, for these adult children of parental alienation, the catalyst was witnessing the alienating parent um, pretty much treat other people the same way that that parent had treated the targeted parent. And in this way, the, alien, the adult child began to understand the problem isn't with the targeted parent, it's with the way the alienating parent treats people. In one case, the alienating parent got remarried and tried to turn the kid against the stepmom after that divorce. And again, a new marriage and a new stepmom and a new, you know, set of, and eventually this person's like, wait a minute, you know, my dad is doing this to everybody. He doesn't want me to have a relationship with anybody. The problem isn't with my mom. 
And so the adult child could see that the problem was with the personality and relational style of the alienating parent and not the targeted parent. In a couple of instances, catching the alienating parent in a significant lie sparked the realization that the alienating parent had also lied about the targeted parent. So for one person, the lie was, I would call a pretty big lie that the child had a disease that she did not have. But in some cases, it was a series of smaller lies that accumulated to an awareness that the alienating parent is habitually dishonest if he or she feels compelled to do so. And this put everything said about the targeted parent in a new light and it allowed the child to be open to questioning, um, you know, whereas up until then, they didn't really question anything the alienating parent said. Everything was taken as the truth because the child had no reason to doubt what that parent had said. And then the final catalyst was becoming a parent oneself. In these instances, the individual wanted his or her child to have a close and loving bond with both parents and realize that this is what uh, she deserved as a child and needed as a child. So having one's own child initiated the realization process for Veronica, for example, one of the people I interviewed, by highly highlighting the importance of both parents in her child's life and in the development of a young child. And when she went through her divorce, Veronica worked hard to keep her husband engaged and involved with the children. And it was through that effort that she came to the awareness that her mother could have and should have done more to promote her father's relationship with her. So it was clear from the interviews and also from all the coaching I've done since that there is no magic bullet. There is no one catalyst that works for everyone. For example, in one case, the death of the alienating parent entrenched the alienation for the child. And in another, it freed the adult child to come to a more clear, realistic assessment of her childhood. Okay, we're gonna switch gears. So for the past hour, we've been looking at alienation from the adult child's experience. And now we're gonna look at it from the parent's point of view, specifically what you as a parent can do outside of legal action to try to heal the relationship with an adult alienated child. And everything I say applies to grandparents who has, have a breach with an adult child or with the son-in-law or daughter-in-law who they experience to be the gatekeeper. Okay, I want you to close your eyes, take a deep breath. I invite you to imagine that you're standing on the bank of a turbulent river and your adult child is on the other side of the river, and the river represents all of the hurt and anger that lies between the two of you. And if you're like other targeted parents, the actions that you've taken up to now to reconnect with your adult alienated child represent you standing on your side of the river, calling out across the river you know, to your child. Perhaps you're saying, if you knew my side of the story, you wouldn't be so hurt and angry with me. Or perhaps you said, I'm sorry for everything and anything I've done, or you think I might have done that could have possibly hurt you. But it hasn't worked. Because in keeping with the metaphor of the river, it's like standing on your side of the riverbank, asking your child to come to your side and look at the relationship from your point of view. And that doesn't work. I understand why parents do that. They write letters um, or talk to their child, and they try to explain their perspective. It's because targeted parents think you know, my kid is mad at me because she believes something that isn't true, whatever it is, it's a lie. And if I can just explain to my child, that whatever it is, it's a lie, my child won't be mad at me anymore. And I can tell you that really does not work because it's asking the child to do all the work of understanding the relationship from the parent's point of view. So I, what I want to do is describe to you a method of writing a letter that keeping with the river metaphor involves building a bridge and walking across the bridge and standing next to your adult child, shoulder to shoulder, looking back at the relationship from his or her point of view. Now, many of you, upon hearing what I just said, might be thinking, you know, something like, why should I apologize for something I didn't do? Or you might think, I already tried that and it didn't work. Or you might be thinking, I'm a victim here. Why should I be chasing my child? And I'm going to try to answer each of those questions. But first, I do want to be clear. At no point do I recommend apologizing for something you didn't do. I think that parents sometimes get 
trapped in this binary thought process that either you prove you didn't do it or you apologize. And I firmly believe there's a middle space that involves acknowledging your child's perspective without necessarily agreeing with it or arguing about the facts. And I'm gonna get into that more throughout the rest of my talk. The second concern that you might have is that what I'm recommending has already been tried and failed. And that is certainly possible. However, I can say that many people have told me over the years that they followed what I suggested because there's something like what I'm gonna go through now in the back of one of my books. And they said, I followed it and I sent the letter. But then when I asked them, you know, send me what you wrote, it isn't really what I'm talking about. It's very hard to do this on your own. And so you might have thought that you already tried this, but somehow maybe you hadn't gotten all the elements the way that I would recommend them to be. And this is something I do offer with my clients, but you can, you know, you can find somebody else to help you. Just I do think it needs another pair of eyes. It certainly doesn't have to be me. So you might be thinking that you already tried it um, and may, maybe you have, but maybe you didn't really do it quite that way. The third concern you might have is that it's unfair. Why should you as the targeted parent or grandparent who's already been maligned and mistreated, why should you have to do this really hard work of building the bridge? And to that, I'd say, I absolutely agree. It is terribly unfair and you certainly do not have to do it. But here are the reasons to do it, even if it's unfair. One, you're the parent, and parents generally have to make the greater effort in the parent-child relationship. Two, you're older and have more life experience, so it's fitting for you to be the one to do this work. And three, you're the person who's most in touch with the desire to have a repaired relationship. Of course, you can keep doing what you're doing, or you could decide to try something new. It's obviously your choice. I'm here to offer you a way to think about doing something new. You get to decide if it makes sense to you. You also may be asking at this point whether it's been successful. I have lots of people ask me what's my success rate is, and my answer is it's often successful, but certainly not always. I've had many, many successes over the years based on helping targeted parents and grandparents write these letters, but certainly not in every case. It's not a magic wand although I wish it were, I can say with great certainty that the letter has never done any harm. I've never had a parent, with one exception, and I will explain, call me and tell me that the letter made everything worse. And when, this, when that parent told me that her child had a very, very bad reaction to the letter, I was so alarmed, I gave her a free coaching session immediately because I wanted to understand what had happened. And thankfully, it turned out that the letter sparked a renewed interest in the child to have a relationship with my client and she just didn't, she didn't mean to say the letter made everything worse. She meant to say that she needed help navigating, communicating with her child now that they were relating again. Um, so I want to be clear that this bridge that we're talking about, it is forged from, oh, I'm sorry, look at this. Here are the reasons why you have to build the bridge. Okay, the bridge is forged from the love you have for your child and the belief that your child still loves you, even if he or she can't admit it to him or herself. All right, so that's what the bridge is. So here's a helpful image that I'd like to offer you. It's the mother bunny in the beloved baby book, The Runaway Bunny. In this book, the baby bunny imagines various ways that he might run away. Perhaps he'll join the circus, or perhaps he'll become a crocus in a hidden garden, or a bird that flies away, or a sailboat that sails away. And in response, the mother never gets her feelings hurt. She never gets angry. She always responds with a loving message, such as, if you become a bird and fly away, I will be a tree that you come home to. If you become a crocus in a hidden garden, I will be a gardener and I will water you. If you go flying on a flying trapeze, I will be a tightrope walker and I will walk across the air to you. In the end, the bunny decides he will just be a little boy and run into the house and he's hugged by his mommy. And I love this mother bunny because she never gets offended or insulted by her child's desire for separation and independence. She maintains a steady, consistent, positive image of her role in her child's life. She's able to respond to his rejection in a loving and connected manner. Now, to be fair, there doesn't seem to be another parent bunny in another burrow somewhere undermining her, so it's a lot easier for her to stay compassionate and connected 
But what is required of you is to stay compassionate and connected. And I invite you to channel your inner mother bunny or daddy bunny when thinking about writing this letter. So um, the bridge is your effort to speak from your heart to your child's heart. It's not a demand or expectation for an apology. It's not a demand or expectation that the child sees the situation from your point of view. It's not a demand or expectation that the child view the other parent the same way you do, nor does it involve groveling and an insincere contrition on your part for crimes not committed. The bridge is a heartfelt effort to see the relationship from your child's point of view. It is standing on the banks of the other side of the river and looking at the relationship with your child from the child's perspective. And what I want to say here is that alienation works when the favored parent takes real things that the targeted parent did and interprets those actions as proof that the targeted parent does not love the child. The child has a distorted thought and feeling that the targeted parent is unsafe, unloving, and unavailable. And that is the perspective that you will take is in what way, what are the real things that you did that might have hurt your child's feelings? And we'll get into that more in a bit. Um, the letter is an opportunity for you to show yourself to be safe, loving, and available. Okay. Um, so the, to me, the benefits of this letter is that it's an opportunity, as I said, for you to show yourself to be safe, loving, and available to experientially counter the distorted message. When your child reads the letter, that's an experience of you in the moment that runs counter to the lie. The letter is an opportunity for you to expand your own awareness of your relationship from your child's point of view. And this can create a greater capacity in you to respond to your child in a way that will affirm the relationship. The letter can create a paradigm shift within you that can affect how you feel and think about your child. And so it's an opportunity to induce greater compassion within you for your child's suffering. I wanna return for a moment to the idea, and then I'm gonna to get to this homework, um, of a space that neither demands that your child see things from your point of view, nor agrees with the child's false, false narrative. And to make this point, I want to tell you about a client of mine who told me that when her child was seven years old, she asked the father she could move away with her little boy to another state because they would have a better life there, according to her, and he said yes. So she sold her house and quit her job and found a new house and a new job several states away. The day before she was set to leave, the father filed an emergency motion to prevent her from taking the boy. And she lost at the temporary hearing, but she decided to move away anyway so she wouldn't lose her new job at home and she thought she would eventually win a trial, but she didn't. And she was never the primary parent again. And according to her, her son became alienated from her. By the time she came to me, she had already written letters to him explaining that it wasn't her fault that she moved away without him. And she tried to explain the sequence of events as she understood them, but that didn't really work. Um, because in doing this, she was asking her son to look at the situation from her point of view which required him to admit that he was wrong for being hurt and angry. So I helped her write a letter, which in part asked the boy if he felt abandoned by her, did he miss her and need her to be there when she wasn't. The point is that the bridge involves looking at the experience from the child's point of view and being interested and empathic with the child's experience. And by going into the child's pain, you can heal the pain. Many targeted parents feel fear that if you go into the pain and ask about and acknowledge whatever it is that's hurting the child, that it will inflame the child's hurt and anger, but I've never found that to be the case. Okay, so here's the homework. <clears throat> Before you write the letter, you need to do these three pieces of homework. Now, I'm going to walk you through it, and I'm going to use the scenario of a mother alienated from a daughter, but you can plug in the proper specifics for yourself. It's just going to make it easier for me to explain it. The first piece of homework is to imagine that your adult alienated daughter has made a new friend and that friend says to your daughter after a while, hey, I notice that you don't really mention your mom. You don't take her calls or texts. What's the deal? I think you can imagine that your daughter would not say to this new friend, 
well, my father engaged in the 17 primary parental alienation strategies and fostered my unjustified rejection of my mother. I mean, don't you just wish your child would say that, but you won't because if she had that awareness, most likely you would have a relationship. She also probably will not say, well, I'm psychotic and my behavior has no relationship to reality. And nor would she say, you know, I don't know. And nor would she say, well, my mother slurps her soup and therefore I cannot have anything to do with her. And nor would she say, I'm a cruel and sadistic person and I just want to make my mother suffer for no reason. And the reason she will not say these things is that as a human being, she has a need to experience herself as a rational person who is a good person who has good reasons for doing what she does. It's not likely that uh, this hypothetical daughter would admit to being brainwashed or being cruel or being frivolous for cutting off a parent. She has a plausible, internally consistent explanation for her behavior that allows her to live with herself and her choices. And the reason she does is because you, the targeted parent, is an imperfect parent because you're a human being and you have hurt your child and you have frustrated her and disappointed her because all parents at some point hurt and frustrate and disappoint their children. Without the alienating parent in the background, she would not have cut you off because of your flaws, but you do have flaws and there has been conflict in the relationship. And that is what she would share with this new friend who asked, hey, how come you don't talk to your mom? So the first piece of homework is to write a list of grievances about the relationship from your daughter's point of view. And this serves two purposes. First, it's an exercise for you in perspective taking. It's your first opportunity to cross that bridge and look at the relationship from your child's point of view. And the list you'll make will get incorporated into the letter you will be writing. The list must be from the child's point of view. Um, it, so it should say things like, I don't talk to my mom because she broke up the family, hurt my dad, stole my money, favored my brother, yelled at me, didn't trust me, etc. Whatever is going to end up on the list. You don't have to agree with these points. In fact, I assume you will not agree with all of them. You just have to write them down and as a way of beginning to consider the relationship from your child's point of view. The second homework assignment is to think of an activity you engaged in with your child that was a fun and positive experience that also has a positive aroma attached to the memory. Examples might include taking your child to a favorite bakery every Saturday to get a special cookie or going out for pizza or baking grandma's lasagna recipe, or going on a nature walk. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to take a drink of coffee. Okay, or giving the puppy a bubble bath, or gardening, or going to the ocean, or having a campfire. You don't need to write anything down in advance, but you do need to think about it and be ready to reflect on that memory and write about it when the letter is written. And the third piece of homework is to have a photograph of your child when she was five years of age. Not a photograph of her loving you. The point is not to prove to her that she used to love you. You just wanna find a photo of her looking like her true self. But I wanna warn you that some people have strong emotional reactions when doing the homework. It's certainly understandable going through photographs, thinking of fond memories, Considering your child's grievances can activate your feelings of loss and grief and sadness and maybe even anger and frustration. Make sure you do the homework when you have the emotional time and space to process whatever comes up. Once the homework is completed, you're ready to write the letter and I'm gonna walk you through the elements and I will use an example of a father writing to a son. So the first is a loving greeting. Then there's an acknowledgement of the distance, and I'm going to go through each of these um, one at a time and give you an example. So there's a wish and a vision and an intention and an apology and three wonder paragraphs, an invitation, a memory, a photograph, and an ending. Okay, so now I'm going to go through each of them. So the... Um, you wanna start with a loving greeting. It cannot sound like a business letter. 
you know, John colon, right? It's not a formal letter. You want to say something like my dearest John or to my precious son. It has to sound like you. So it shouldn't be like Shakespearean, you know, but it should be you at your most loving. You don't want your child to see a cold and abrupt beginning and feel, uh uh-oh. You want to signal from the very beginning that you're writing the letter from a place of love. In the first paragraph, you want to acknowledge that there's a breach in the relationship. You can say, I've been thinking a lot lately about the distance in our relationship. It's been such a long time since we've been close. Um, When I held you in my arms for the first time and saw your little button nose and bright blue eyes filled with curiosity and your darling sprouts of hair, I was filled with awe and love for you. I imagined a lifetime of love and closeness when I held you. Never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined that we would end up where we are today with so much hurt and pain between us. So in this first paragraph, you are um, expressing an acknowledgement that things are not working out well. And then you're going to tell a little story about um, what it felt like to hold your child for the first time. If you're a grandparent writing a letter to a daughter-in-law or son-in-law, you could write about meeting them for the first time and and just focusing on the the positive. I imagine welcoming you into the family and I was looking forward to getting to know you. In the next paragraph, you're going to express a wish for a better relationship. You could say something like, you are my precious child. I want nothing more than to have a better relationship with you, a relationship filled with love and laughter and a sense of safety and happiness and belonging. I have a vision of our relationship as one filled with love and sharing in which you know that I'm there for you, et cetera. This is not a place to talk about your pain or suffering or what's been taken away from you. In the third paragraph, you're going to express some kind of vision for a better relationship, you know, that sometimes parents and their adult children have conflict and distance, and usually they can find a way to work things out that feels right for everyone. Notice that mutuality there that feels right for everyone. You're not saying to your child, you know, walk across the bridge, see things from my point of view. You have to bend to my will. Um, Then you're going to have in this uh, paragraph a little story about two people who had a falling out and worked it out, but you're not going to put too much detail in there. So you're not going to say, you know, you may not know this, but Uncle Joe was a real jerk when he was your age and then he broke grandpa's heart, but finally he came around. That's the point isn't to tell a story about one person bending again to the will of the other or one person having to admit that they were bad. It's just people have falling outs and then they can patch things up. And usually it's better when they do. That's the point of that. Um, Then you're going to tell your child that you've been thinking about the relationship from their point of view and um, what it felt like for them, what was working, what didn't work, so that you can, as the parent, try to Express your, you know, regrets as appropriate or your desire to atone. That's the point of this is to say to the child, I'm trying to understand what this was like for you. Okay, then there's going to be three wonder paragraphs. Um, And this is, so when you make your list of homework, Uh, the first homework, which is the list of the child's grievances. There might be 10, 15 things on it. You know, my uh, parent didn't listen to me. He didn't trust me. He was cheap. He favored my other, you know, siblings, whatever. From that list, when I'm doing the letter, I try to organize the grievances um, into three categories. Um, And usually there's some theme, like there might be a bunch of smaller complaints about money or about not supporting the child's hobbies and interests or whatever. It takes a while. Sometimes I'll spend a half an hour just talking about each of the things on the list until we come up with three um, big complaints that the child has. And then I try to put them in chronological order. Um, And so here again is a hypothetical Um, of a father talking to a son 
Um, and I call these wonder paragraphs because often I like the first sentence to be, I'm wondering if. But if you know for sure, like your child wrote you a letter, I'm furious with you because you stole my college money. And I'm just making that up as an example. You wouldn't say, I'm wondering if you're upset about because you think I stole your college money. That would be bizarre because your kids already told you. So in that case, you would say, I understand that, or I'm aware that you are upset with me about whatever. So the example I have here is a wonder because the parent, the hypothetical parent, isn't certain that that's what it is. So the, um, you know, here it says, I'm wondering if you're still upset with me about my being the one to end the marriage. Um, oh, it says with your father. So here's a written from the mom's point of view. You were just a little boy, just six years old when that happened. It must've been so confusing to, for you to go from living with mommy and daddy together in one home to going back and forth between the two homes. So you can see it's describing the situation from the child's point of view. And still in this first wonder paragraph, then there are questions. What was that like for you to know that I was the parent who chose the, to end the marriage? Do you feel that if I cared more for you, I would have made a different choice? Were there times when you felt particularly mad at me for making that decision? Were there times when the divorce was particularly hard for you? And then this first wonder paragraph has a wish. If I could do things differently, I would work harder to understand what it felt like for you when the family changed. And I would work harder to make sure that you felt safe and loved even though the family was going through such a big change. Here's another wonder paragraph. I've also been thinking about your being upset with me because you believe that I stole your college money. This is something that you've shared with me many times over the years. So here you can see the parent isn't gonna say, I wonder because the kids obviously said to the parent, I'm mad at you for this. I want you to know that I appreciate your letting me know what's bothering you. And I always wanna be available to hear your concerns with me. What was it like for you to think that I took the money? Did you believe that I demanded to take that money away from you in order to hurt or spite you? So here we're in the questioning part of the paragraph, deepening an interest, really trying to understand what this was like for the child. And then here's some empathy that must've been very confusing for you to think that I would wanna take something away from you. I hurt for you knowing that you thought that your daddy would do that to you. And now we have the wish. I wish that I had done a better job reassuring you that I wanted to and intended to help pay for college so that you could feel in your heart that I love you and never want to deprive you of what is rightly yours. And then the third example, I'm also aware that you're upset with me because I did not agree to buy a horse for you with mommy. That was such a painful time for you when you thought that Jupiter would be your horse, a dream come true. And then I had to be the one to tell you that it wasn't going to happen. So again, in the first part of the wonder paragraph, it's just a description of the situation from the child's point of view. That must have been a crushing blow for you to have something almost happen and then have it snatched away. I imagine that you thought about Jupiter for a long time afterwards and felt upset with me for a long time. I wonder what you thought about my decision. Now we have the questions. Did it seem cruel to you? Did it seem to you that I was trying to hurt you and that I was selfish for not agreeing to buy a horse with your mother? Now the wish, more than anything, I wish that I'd had the money to buy Jupiter for you or that I had thought it was a good idea for me to buy a horse with your mother. I wish that I'd been able to convey to you that my decision was not made lightly or out of any ill will for you or your mother. So each of the three wonder paragraphs takes an issue unpacks it, you were this years old, this is what happened, but from the child's point of view, and then there are the questions, what was that like, what did you think, and then ending with a wish. Okay, in the next paragraph, you invite your child to respond to the letter. So the words that I suggest, or I hope that you can see, I'm trying to understand what our relationship has felt like for you. I would love to hear back from you, any thoughts and feelings you would like to share about any of the issues I wrote about or any other issues in our relationship that are on your mind. Perhaps you'd like to write a letter back. Perhaps you would prefer to talk on the phone or even maybe meet with me with a therapist of your choosing. Anything that works for you would be fine with me. So you're just like, I'm, you know, 
really trying to make it as easy as possible for your child to respond. Okay, now you, in the next paragraph, you're going to discuss the sense memory. This was the second part of the homework, was to think about something fun you did with your child that has a positive smell. So here's an example that I have, but and it's based on taking a nature walk, but it really could be anything. I went to the riverbanks by Valley Park the other day and walked around the path. It looked as magical as ever. I took many deep breaths of that special combination of earth and water and trees and fresh air that you love so much. I have so many wonderful memories of taking walks there with you in the spring. You were always so excited to see the water rushing so clear and clean. Do you remember climbing onto the big rock and just sitting there listening to the water and smelling the freshness of the waterfall? Those were such lovely times with you. You were always so brave and you were up for any kind of nature adventure and you were such a kind big brother checking in to see how your little sister was doing. Nature seems to bring out the best in you and I always think of you when I'm surrounded by pine trees and sweet flowers and clear water. Um, so the point of all of this is, I think I kind of went ahead. Um, nope, I just added a little in my speaking than what I have on the slide. But the point is you keep it on the child. You keep it on something positive about the child's character. That's why I was reading, but I didn't, I don't think it's on the slide. You were such a kind big brother checking in to see how your little sister was doing. So you're, you're making the memory a positive reflection on those something about the character of the child. Then you're going to mention the photograph. That's in the next paragraph here. Um, you're going to say something like, I'm enclosing one of my favorite photos of you. And then you're going to say something about the photograph that is about the child. So here I have, you were just six years old. Your first baby teeth just came out. You were so adorable. There you are snuggling with Fluffy, your first pet bunny. You were so careful and loving when you held Fluffy, so aware of how she was feeling. So you can see that, again, it's a positive reflection on the character of the child and that you will write yourself about the photograph. So let's say the photograph was the first day of kindergarten. You would say, you got up so early, you couldn't wait to be a big school child. You know, you had your backpack on and you were ready to go. You just, you know, couldn't wait to, you know, join your friends at school. So it's telling a little story about behind, you know, whatever is behind the photograph. But the last sentence <clears throat> has to be word for word. It has to say, I have a copy of this picture taped onto my fridge. And every time I go into the kitchen, I see your beautiful face and smile. You can't say, I have a copy of this picture on my desktop. And when I'm sitting at work, I look at it and get a chuckle. No, I have a copy of the picture on the fridge. Every time I go into the kitchen, I see your beautiful face and smile. Now, if you don't like the word beautiful, you could put adorable, endearing, charming, you know, cute, but it has to be obviously positive. And it has to be the fridge, it has to be the kitchen. The intent is to create a sticky symbolic connection between you and your child, such that when your child goes into, you know, his kitchen, he will think of you going into your kitchen thinking of him. And of course the kitchen represents, you know, both literal as well as symbolic nurturance. So that's the reason it really should be exactly that. Okay, now you're gonna end the letter speaking from your heart to your child's heart, expressing your love and hope for a better relationship. So here's my example. John, you are my precious son and my heart is filled with love for you. I hope you can see from this letter that I'm trying to see our relationship from your perspective, I look forward to hearing from you and hope this letter will be the beginning of a way forward for us. My arms are open, my door is open, my heart is open. But of course, you can really make that your own. Um, okay, so have somebody read the letter, unless you're going to work on it with a professional. All right, you need to make sure that the letter isn't leaking any kind of resentment or anger or self-pity. Um, is it authentic? Can you stand by it? You can't write some whole beautiful thing that you don't agree with because if your child does have a positive response, they're going to be like, oh, that was so awesome. I love paragraph two. And you'll be thinking, oh, I didn't mean a word of it. That isn't the way to begin to repair the relationship. 
Uh, yeah. So can you live with what you said? Um, and does it miss any big issues? You know, if your child has told you in 15 angry emails, they're furious at, for you for X reason, and you don't mention it in the letter, that's not going to look good. You're going to look tone deaf, as they say. Okay, so let's talk about when and how to send the letter. So the ideal timing is to send the letter to the child when the other parent will not be present. So if your kid's just about to go off to college, wait. Or if they're home for this, you know, if they're about to come home for the summer, get the letter to them before they come home. If they're, you know, about to go be, you know, there's some kind of uh, separation between the child and the favorite parent that's coming up, wait until that separation has occurred and then send the letter. <clears throat> I generally don't have an opinion about email versus mail. If you are gonna send it as email, um, make sure that you put it in the header. I'm thinking about our relationship from your point of view. Um, so, okay, so I already said that. Um, okay, this is a big one. You have to manage your expectations. I believe that an angry response is a good response, but it doesn't mean it feels good. Um, obviously, a good response like, hey, that's an awesome letter, that would be fantastic. No response is very hard for parents to deal with. Be prepared. It might make sense to resend the letter again. Um, sometimes the letter paves the way for some future as yet unseen reparation. So. It could be much later, the kid says, hey, you know that letter you wrote a while back? So it's kind of like the knock. You may not see all the good that it's doing, um, but I want you to hold on to that because that's part of what makes not hearing more tolerable. If you get a negative response, what a jerk, how stupid, your letter sucks, uh, something like that, I suggest that you respond right away with, Thank you so much for reading and responding to my letter. You've given me a lot to think about. I'm going to reflect on this and I'll be back shortly. I've had it happen many times that a parent sets up a coaching session with me and maybe it takes a week or two to schedule it. And then they tell me, oh yeah, like two weeks ago, I heard back from my kid and I had no idea how to respond, which I understand. But you can't leave your kid hanging. So this is like a placeholder. Thank you so much for responding. I'm going to reflect and get back to you. Then you can set up a session or take whatever time or use whatever resource you need to be ready to respond. But don't just leave your kid hanging. Um, if you don't hear back, you can continue to text message, what I call the happy Tuesday message. Like there's no real purpose. It's just, hey, the sun is shining. I'm thinking of you. Um, you can send a text that a little bit more pointed, I love you and want to make things right between us. You might say, you must be very hurt and angry with me, dot, dot, dot. Um, that might get them to respond to you. Um, you could have some kind of general invitation, want to get together sometime and do something random. Or a specific invitation, you know, want to catch the new blah, blah movie this weekend. Those are the kinds of text messages you should be cycling through on a regular basis. Um, oh, okay, that's, sorry. Um, my screen was going a little crazy there for a moment, so just ignore that. Okay, I'm gonna spend the last um, bit of time I have, I think I have like five minutes left, and I'm going to try to answer some of your questions. Um, I combined some of them. I made some of the questions a little bit more general. Um, so um, one person asked, you know, how long should I continue to reach out with no response? And my answer is as long as you can, unless it's harming you. So if you said to me, it's ruining my life, I can't get out of bed in the morning or find pleasure in anything because every time I reach out, it breaks my heart again. I'd say, take a break. You are a separate person. You deserve to have some pleasure and joy in your life. But otherwise, if you can manage it, I believe you should be reaching out, you know, once a week. Unless your kid said, you know, 
um, I'm going to kill myself if you reach out. I guess that would be the other reason to, to give it a break. But otherwise, you don't know the internal process that your child is going through. And you don't know what grain of sand will finally tip things in your direction. So if you can hang in there and continue to reach out, I encourage you to do so. Um, somebody else asked, is it appropriate to reach out if you're blocked on social media? So um, I think people who are blocked should still text because I think that sometimes these kids do a quick unblock, look at the text and then block again. So I don't think it means you should completely stop. Um, so if you're going to be accused of harassment or if you've been told by the police or, you know, you better knock it off but you feel like you want to do something, one thing you could do is create a website in your name. So it's like, for me, it would be like amybaker.com or whatever, you know, just your name. So if your kid Googles you, they'll find your website. And on that website could be childhood photos of your child or poems or a letter that you write to your child, including the letter that we just went through. It can't be maudlin, it can't be manipulative, it can't be guilt provoking. It can't be about parental alienation, but it would be your version of texting and emailing if you're not allowed to do that. Somebody asked, how do you treat PTSD in a targeted parent? And so first of all, I'm sorry for any parent who has PTSD. I'm not a licensed clinician, so I really don't think I can answer this. Um, but I do know that there are treatments for PTSD. Usually it requires processing the trauma so that it doesn't flood and disrupt your life. And there are, um, you know, good programs out there for that. I don't know that, you know, sometimes people say PTSD and what they mean is just like the grief and the sadness, whereas PTSD is a very specific diagnosis with very specific symptoms. So sometimes people with PTSD might get a treatment like EMDR. That's the eye movement desensitive EMDR. Eye movement desensitization something. And I'm sorry, I forget what the R is. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know that that would be the best treatment and certainly not the only treatment. Um, somebody asked how how do you approach a child who cut you off because of a mix of alienation and estrangement? Alienation meaning the other parent engineered your child's rejection of you and estrangement meaning you contributed to it. I believe the letter that we went through is fine for pure alienation, hybrid meaning a mix of alienation and estrangement, or even pure estrangement. If you beat your child or abandoned them or did something egregious and you want to atone for that, I think the letter would work well. Somebody asked, what else other than a letter can a parent do to increase the likelihood that a child will come around? <coughs> um, I do think that really depends on the specific situation. Um, generally, other than the letter, you know, ongoing texts and emails, but there could be other things that I would think of if I knew more about the situation. Somebody else asked whether to give up after 20 years of no contact. And I do suggest the letter, unless you've worked with me and you've already tried the letter and it didn't work. Um, you know, if you do the letter on your own, make sure that you use the header, if you send it as an email, I have, I am thinking about our relationship from your point of view. If you write it as a hard letter piece of paper and you put it in an envelope and mail it to your child, I would write those words on the back of the envelope. I'm thinking about our relationship from your point of view. Somebody asked, why do alienated children not express their feelings when they're safe with the targeted parent? What can the targeted parent do that will bring them to trust them? So I'm going to assume this is an adult child, but I don't know for sure. So if you have contact with an adult, formerly alienated child who is back in your life, but you feel that that relationship lacks depth and authenticity and spontaneity, 
I suggest you consider doing the Restoring Family Connections activities with that adult child to deepen the relationship and repair the tears in the fabric of the relationship. So Restoring Family Connections is a, a sort of a manual that clinicians can use. It's not therapy, but you do have to have a licensed clinician do the activities with you and your adult child. I did create the Restoring Family Connections program. There's information on it on my website. The program actually has its own website and you can find out even more there. But it is very, very common for the kid to come back, but not to come back fully and people are walking on tiptoes and there's all of these triggers. Uh-oh, if I say this word or that word, they might cut me off again. And it's very painful to have your child back in your life, but feel like there are these sort of taboos and landmines that you're navigating. And I think the kid feels the same way, the adult child. So that's the purpose of restoring family connections. Somebody else asked uh, kind-hearted letters and gifts um, that I send to my adult uh, child have the opposite effect. Um, when is it necessary to step back completely and hope they reach out on their own? So I don't actually know what was in the kind-hearted letters, but I think that something more than being kind-hearted is needed and being kind-hearted is wonderful and it's definitely necessary, but it might not be sufficient to have the child feel comfortable enough or ready to reach out to you. And that is the point of the letter because um, it is hopefully, it should be kind-hearted, but there's also more to it. <clears throat> what kind of therapy would be helpful for a 15-year-old alienated child and parent? And this really depends on how alienated, if it, the child is mild or moderately alienated, that's very different than severely alienated. The common theme that I would say that is essential for any kind of therapy with any level of alienation is a therapist who truly understands parental alienation dynamics and is able to correct the child's distortions and hold the favorite parent accountable. And really the best way to find somebody is through word of mouth from other targeted parents who live in your area. Um, I also want to say that targeted parents go into, um, if it is, if we're talking about reunification therapy, targeted parents go into that space with their angry, entitled, arrogant, hostily rejecting child and the therapist, and often inadvertently behave in ways that make it hard for the therapist to see that it's alienation and make it hard for the child to feel that you are safe, loving, and available. So I do suggest getting some kind of coaching and support before you walk into that setting. Somebody else asked, how do I handle a situation in which my ex is lying to my children about me and creating fear in them about COVID? Um, and again, I just don't know really that much about this situation. If the kids are under 18, sometimes a parenting coordinator is helpful to hold that favored parent accountable. There's less wiggle room in um, maneuvering the schedule and making changes. I don't know if that would be helpful here. Sometimes parenting coordinators give the favored parent too much leeway. So um, I, I guess the other thing I wanna say is that in terms of the children having fear induced into them by the other parents, I do think that there are parenting strategies to help you not take the bait, to not behave in a way that reinforces the lie. And it's, re it's, it's hard. It's, it doesn't just sort of come naturally to people, for example, to show gratitude when your child complains about you. And I'm not saying like, oh, gee, thanks, treat me badly. But there are um, strategies for interacting with alienated kids that don't make things worse and sometimes make things better. Another question is, when is it okay to tell my adult child about parental alienation? I would say never unless she asks, because the asking involves a willingness and an interest in, hey, what do you think happened to my relationship with you? But unless your kid asks, they don't want to know. And if you impose it on her, like, here's this book about alienation, or here's this DVD, I want you to watch it. 
you're saying to your child, see things from my point of view. I believe you've been tricked, lied to, manipulated, and that will very likely make things worse. Somebody else asked, how do you reach out when there's a fear or concern about a restraining order? I would say, if, you're, if there already is a restraining order, do not violate it. Um, I don't think you can get a restraining order against you for writing texts. Maybe you would want to back up and be less than once a week, maybe once a month at that point. Consult with a lawyer. Hey, if I write a text to my kid once a month and they tell me they don't want me to, can, I, is, can they get a restraining order against me? You can, I think that's a knowable uh, question that somebody, a legal professional would have an answer to. If you were told, you know, absolutely, you're going to get in trouble if you continue to reach out to your kid, then revert to, to the website that I was mentioning because it's passive. It's out there in the world. Your child will find it if they're looking for it, but you're not sort of putting it in their face. <coughs> uh, what do you do if the son-in-law is gatekeeping? I would say write a version of the letter to that person. Don't treat your son-in-law like a gate, <laughs> like a means to an end. Try to repair the relationship as an end unto itself. And if you can do that, then um, not only will you have the benefit of having a son-in-law, like a good relationship with that person, but they're not going to want to be a gate to your child if you have a better relationship with them. Somebody asked what programs are available for adult alienated children. And there are no court ordered programs for adult alienated children because the courts can't make an adult participate in treatment. There is restoring family connections, um, which again, I created, but you need a licensed clinician to actually implement. And that is for adult alienated children, but the adult alienated child has to want to do it on some level. And I do, sometimes help targeted parents figure out, well, how do I get my adult kid to agree to do restoring family connections? And there's some sort of art and strategy to that. Will the alienated child and grandchild ever come to realize what the alienated parent has done? Well, you know now the answer is some absolutely do. And we know a lot more now about how to make that happen than we knew back when I did that first study. but. More than that, I can't make a prediction on any particular situation. Somebody asked, what else can I do to reach out to an adult alienated child? And I guess I don't know what you've already done, so I wouldn't be able to answer. But my general advice is to write the letter, send it at least two times if you don't get a response, you know, wait a maybe like a month between, and uh, continue to reach out with text messages. But again, I don't know your specific situation, so I can't say more than that. Um, I'm going to go through, I think there's three more, how to deal with anxiety with parental alienation. I don't know if the person meant the anxiety the parent is experiencing, and there's a lot of support for targeted parents and therapy for people with anxiety, or whether you mean anxiety with an adult child or a younger child. So I, I don't know enough to really dig into that one. Um, okay. I'd like to know how she, I suppose that's me, how would I manage false allegations of sexual abuse? Um, I do think there are ways to protect yourself from false allegations of abuse. Again, that's part of my coaching. I could go through that with you for each of the major types of abuse. What are some of the things that you could be doing that could inadvertently get you into trouble that you might not be aware of? Um, so that is something I highly recommend people be uh, very cognizant of. All targeted parents are at risk of a false allegation. Um, but I think this person was asking whether it should be included in the apology letter. I really would have to know more about, about what the allegation was before I could give. I don't want to give any bad advice. I'm going to err on the side of not giving advice. Um, should a parent also write a letter to an adult child who's alienated but does speak to them sometimes? Um, and should they ask this child to help them reach out to their sibling? So I definitely think if there's a problem in the relationship, if you're <clears throat> if there's no contact or very, very minimal contact, then the letter makes sense. 
if you do have some contact, then I would suggest moving forward and inviting them into restoring family connections. In terms of asking the child to help with the siblings, I think you get one, one time to do that. And it would be to say, how would you feel if, or if you ever think about um, talking to your siblings about me, you know, I would like to, I'd be interested in having a conversation with you about that. And I did not say that artfully, but the point is you bring it up once. And if the kid says no and shuts you down, then you don't bring it up again. Cause then you're treating that kid like a means to an end and you're putting that relationship at risk. <clears throat> All right. And the last question is what can be done by a targeted parent to protect their adult children impacted by alienating parents and alienating parents, extended family, um, also involved as a cult. Well, if you as a targeted parent have an adult child and you think that that child is at risk, if you have no relationship, you start with the letter. If you have some relationship, then you go to restoring family connections because it is designed to protect and repair that relationship. All right, I think I ended right on time. I um, hope this was helpful. I'm going to thank Elaine again for, um, you know, inviting me to give this talk and I'm going to sign off. <laughs>